The moderate jesters are having a meeting, where Laplace suggests they reconsider their current plans. Yuki definitely doesn't want to get on that slime's bad side, though Kagali, the once demon lord Kazalim, wonders why they can't just stay friends. Apparently Rimuru has begun to suspect Yuki, even though he doesn't have any hard evidence. This was bound to happen eventually, but the entire group agrees to keep their heads low. Yuki then assigns the jesters to deliver some special goods, before stating that Rimuru took the kids, and even saved them using spirits. The jesters realize this is the same thing Leon did with Shizu, and Yuki orders them to uncover why Demon Lord Leon is acquiring more special goods. Kagali then wonders what she should do about the upcoming expedition with Demon Lord Rimuru. As elven royalty, it'd be easy for her to discreetly activate the city's magical defenses, though Yuki reminds her that Demon Lord Milam will be there as well. The jesters then depart to meet up with someone named Misha, and Yuki heads out to make some plans in the east. With the festival concluded, people begin to leave. However, Elmesia purchases an estate here in town. You also learn that Eren's bodyguards are actually highly powerful elf warriors. They just wear rings that reduce their strength. Hinata is still around training the kids, and Rimuru is sure that Yuki's aware that he's not giving them back to Inglacia. A few days later, the dungeon officially opens to the public, and it's rather disappointing. None of the challengers have even reached the second floor, and have even died to the rank D monsters. On top of this, some enter the dungeon completely unprepared, not even bringing food. Tempest, however, is in fact profiting, but Rimuru worries they won't get any repeat customers if this continues. Calling an emergency meeting, Rimuru declares the adventurers need some help. Veldor and Ramirez both agree, however Molly recommends they wait a little longer, as stronger people are sure to arrive. That's all well and good, but Veldora wants to do something right now. Rimuru says they should set up a training camp on the first floor, just like a video game tutorial. Masayuki suggests doing away with the safe zones and adding a portal to the dungeon's inn on every single floor. This would give adventurers a comfortable place to use the restroom, instead of just hoping a monster doesn't turn the corner. The group loves this plan and our hero goes on, bringing up the idea of viable save points. Ramirez thinks this would make the inn useless, but it's pointed out that some adventurers will need to report their progress to their patrons, plus they can be priced extremely expensive. With that, Floor 1 is reworked into a training grounds, along with Rimuru removing all deadly traps below Floor 5. Monster difficulty is also reduced, followed by more supplies being added into the loot table. Molly then offers up the idea of adding prize money for the first party each month that clears certain bosses. Each person may only win once, and Molly thinks the hero's party could be the first winner for advertising purposes. Masayuki is extremely uneasy about tackling floor 50, but Molly just knows it'd be a breeze for the great hero. On top of this, there will be a 100 stellar coin reward for the first person to clear the entire dungeon. This grand amount worries Ramirez, until she's reminded who's the final boss. Our slime is also willing to fight anyone who can conquer the dungeon, and Masayuki declares he has no intention of ever battling Rimuru. Upon Molly's exit, Masayuki brings up his future battle with Bovix, so Rimuru promises to think of a way to help him through it. Due to all the changes, the dungeon experience improves, and some people begin progressing at a slow but steady pace. Though it's not long before adventurers from the guild arrive, turning it into a contest to see who can delve deeper. At one point, people even began creating and selling maps, prompting our group to occasionally rearrange the floors. Now there's a certain party, named Green Fury, that's seemingly speedrunning the dungeon. It only took them three days to reach and conquer floor 20, and Rimuru notices they always seem to choose the correct path. Their leader is using elemental communication, which is a high-level skill allowing them to speak directly with spirits. Another meeting is held where Veldora compliments Masayuki's ideas. The hero is stunned upon realizing this to be THE Veldora, followed by Rimuru announcing the Dungeon Master, Demon Lord Ramirez. Molly is then introduced, followed by Masayuki formally stating himself as the hero. Now it's true that Masayuki's unique skill is always active, but Rimuru believes his natural charisma to be praiseworthy as well. With that out of the way, the group discusses the dungeon's finances, which overall are doing fantastic. Ramirez then brings up Green Fury, offering to disrupt their spirit communication. Since it's not against the rules, Rimuru doesn't feel right about punishing them, so Veldora states they can just add in some spirit-free areas. Next, Masayuki wonders if monsters could drop items on death, and Ramirez says she'll have the Dryads force-feed items to some monsters. Then if they add in unidentified items, it will encourage people to leave the dungeon to get them appraised, thus increasing Tempest's profit. 
Everyone happily agrees. Masayuki announces it's time for a system update, leaving everyone but Rimaru very confused. Later that night, Shion hands over a report as Diablo pours some tea. It tastes good, but a bit different than normal, which is because it was surprisingly brewed by Shion. Rimaru openly praises her, and then remembers that he never rewarded Diablo for successfully instating Yom as the King of Falmouth. After a bit of prodding, Diablo reveals he'd like to hire some helpers to take on the more menial tasks, such as destroying entire nations. Rimaru is concerned about their potential strength, but Diablo explains it's just some old friends and that they'd need physical bodies created for them. Assuming it can't be that crazy, Rimuru agrees, followed by Diablo revealing they'll each have underlings of their own. He's expecting a thousand bodies at most, causing Rimuru to exclaim that he's looking to start a war. But he's reassured that Diablo could easily take on all 1,000 of them. It's a few days later that the hero's party clears floor 30, causing all of Tempest to erupt into a massive celebration. His victory against the boss was 100% rigged, but hey, it's great advertising all the same. Molly exclaims the hero is amazing, though in reality, Masayuki didn't do much. But Molly believes he's just being humble. Now the Floor 30 boss was an unintelligent ogre lord, which has a 2% chance to drop a piece of equipment from the ogre set. The full outfit gives a special effect which is super effective against the Floor 40 boss, meaning adventurers will be enticed to grind for the full set. Since the changes, the Dungeon's Inn has been completely packed. The restrooms are likely the primary reason, however it also contains a bath and equipment maintenance services. Due to all of this, the Dungeon's profits continue to rise, so Rimuru thinks it's time to give their workers a proper salary. They definitely have enough money to afford it, but Molly doubts their workers will accept this. Ramirez chimes in asking about her agreed upon payment, and Veldora cuts in wondering if he can be paid as well. Molly had already planned to pay both of them, and Rimuru warns them to be careful with their money. Though of course they reassure him there's nothing to worry about. Moving on to non-dungeon related business, you find out that the population of Tempest has roughly stayed the same since the festival. They've also seen an increase in returning merchants, which is probably due to their high quality alcohol and equipment. With the important stuff out of the way, Rimuru asks if he can have a personal space of his own within the dungeon. Ramirez wonders why, but he only states it's for secret projects. Though after his friends team up against him, Rimuru reveals he's planning to craft physical bodies for more dryads along with Diablo's friends. Now within his secret room, Rimuru begins diligently working on his creations. There's a knock on the door. You've been in this room for multiple days without leaving. So he steps outside to find Shuna and Shion. He swiftly apologizes for causing them to worry, and he comes to find out that Molly has been looking for him. His friend bursts into the meeting hall, exclaiming that another team just beat Floor 30. That seems like good news to our slime, but it's revealed they're already nearing Floor 40. This is due to them abusing a loophole in the rules, which involves the viable save points. You see, at Floor 20, the party of 10 created a save, left the dungeon, each formed their own party of 10, and reloaded their save, now with a 100-man army. Granted, only 10 of them can enter a boss chamber at a time, but if parties attack said boss back to back, it won't have time to properly heal. Technically speaking, Green Fury is playing by the rules, and Molly reveals they're a band of mercenaries known as the Sons of Velt, who seem to be backed by Inglacia. Even with their questionable strategy, Rimuru still isn't worried, as he believes the Floor 40 boss will give them trouble. Though he's told that Veldor and Ramirez believe Green Fury's leader is still holding back. Down inside the dungeon, Rimuru is scolded for his absence, and is told that Green Fury has already made it to floor 38. Using her Mazecraft skill, a 3D hologram shows their progress. I'd like permission to interact with the dungeon. Rimuru asks. Ramirez is hesitant, but gives in, warning him it's a lot of info. Raphael easily breaks down the massive amount of data, determining Green Fury's leader to be above an A-rank adventurer. He effortlessly conjures footage of the previous battles, and Ramirez is concerned with how Rimuru is able to control Mazecraft better than herself. Our hero asks for an evaluation of his own party, prompting Rimuru to rank each of his companions at A- or above, though his unique skill is seriously buffing everyone. Of course, Molly proclaims that the hero must be over rank A for sure, all the while Masayuki keeps his mouth shut. After further evaluation, it's determined that Green Fury has multiple A rank adventurers, meaning even Bovix or Equix will have a tough battle ahead. Our slime then notices something else is wrong, forcing Ramirez to begin explaining the previous three days. You see, Tempest agreed to allow the Paladins to begin their training on Floor 51, and they breezed clear through Floor 60, slaying Alderman without issue. They proceeded to Floor 70 just as easy, but the Elemental Colossus wiped them out. 
This fact alone pissed off Hinata, but then Fritz said he wasn't even sure if Hinata could beat it. Thus, she slayed the Colossus and stormed all the way up to floor 90 in a single day. Yesterday, she blasted clear through the 90s, as not even the elemental dragons did much to slow her down. It then came time for the showdown between Veldora the Storm Dragon and Hinata the Saint. The winner was in fact Veldora, and Molly exclaims it was a battle for the ages. He'd love to see the hero take on Veldora next, and it turns out our dragon is ready to spar any time. Our slime puts an end to that conversation before asking Veldora's evaluation of Hinata. Apparently, her fighting style was similar to the hero that sealed him away, however Hinata had a lot of wasted movement as she tried numerous different strategies. Her ultimate attack, Melt Slash, did in fact damage him, though only slightly. After hearing all of this, Rimuru concludes that the second half of the dungeon is a failure. To begin with, Ultiman is much too weak at the moment, and Ramirez reveals that her Colossus isn't reviving due to it lacking a soul. Luckily though, Green Fury is approaching some nasty slime traps, which will definitely slow them down. In the meantime, Rimuru will power up Ultiman and have Kaijin build a bigger, better Colossus. The intelligent bosses from floor 80 to 90 will train with Hinata, while the dragons should evolve all on their own. Masayuki can tell that Rimuru is scheming something, but all he's told is that he shouldn't progress past floor 41 for the time being. Just before the meeting ends, Molly reveals that Hinata is asking for her prize money, but Rimuru says she's not eligible. Molly would really like for Rimuru to tell her this himself, but he chooses to leave that to the finance manager. If you decide to read the books yourself, be sure to buy them through the Amazon link down below. Doing so really does help support this channel. Upon reaching floor 60, Ultiman falls to his knees, apologizing for his failure. Realistically, it wasn't a fair fight to begin with, considering that Ultiman is no longer able to wield holy magic. Our slime then reveals the skill Faith and Favor, which he learned from Demon Lord Valentine. It allows those who have faith in him to draw on a portion of his power, which then becomes holy magic. Shuna picks it up quickly due to her parser skill, followed by Ultiman unleashing a holy cannon. The only problem is that casting holy magic can sometimes be painful for an undead, so Rimuru teaches him Holy Ray, a variant that won't damage him. Our undead white praises his deity even more, as Rimuru gives him permission to summon some undead friends, even going as far to leave behind some cursed equipment for them to use. Alderman is curious if he can summon a pet, and Rimuru just tells him not to outnumber the adventurers. A few moments later, Milam returns, pissed off that her dragons were defeated. She's dragging a beaten down Gopta by a shirt, yet he's thrilled to have finally conquered. Hell Mode! Veldora steps up to train him next, but Milam becomes extremely defensive of her pupil. Ronka returns battered and bruised as well, so Rimuru orders them both to get some rest. Now our slime is glad that this group is all together, because he recently finished his latest project. He got the idea from Archduke Harold and pulls out an item which Veldora says looks similar to a soul vessel. Next he hands out small black orbs, telling each of them to think about a specific monster they are fond of. Before their eyes, the Master Cores transform into a ghost, skeleton, slime, and living suit of armor. Our Demon Lord exclaims these will be the guardians of the dungeon, which they'll use to expel the intruders. It's pointed out, however, they are much too weak, prompting Rimuru to show them how to use the pseudo-souls to possess their monsters. Our dragon exclaims this is just like a video game, as their avatars will be able to level up and even learn new skills. However, in order to take on Green Fury, they're going to need some powerful equipment, so they meet up with Kurobe and Garm, who are both excited to tackle this new project. In the meantime, our squad practices on low-level adventurers and monsters, sometimes even dying in the process. I mean, Ramirez quite literally controls the dungeon, yet somehow manages to accidentally set off traps, which then end up killing Veldora. Though it doesn't take long for them to improve, as they still have access to some skills such as thought communication and mind acceleration. Then it's around this time that Team Green Fury conquers the Tempest Serpent guarding Floor 40, by using multiple parties to whittle it down once again. Ramirez agrees to have Dryads heal bosses in the future, and it's not long before Green Fury reaches Floor 49. Our squad realizes they no longer have time to wait on their equipment, but Shuna just arrived with a message from Kurobe. With Ramirez as an immovable tank, Veldora dishing out manga-styled moves, Milam darting faster than the eye can see, and Rimuru supporting from the back line, they easily overwhelm their foes. Now originally, they tried a frontal assault and failed, but after using some traps to their advantage, they broke Green Fury's equipment, prompting their leader to call it quits and return home. 
Elsewhere, you find Maribel, a resurrected otherworlder just like Rimuru. In her previous life, she was extremely rich and was no stranger to exploiting the masses through war, just to increase her own wealth. Currently, she is the princess of the Kingdom of Seltrazo and knows all about the Western Council, including the five elders of the Rozo family. Just like in her former life, she is still obsessed with money, which is how she obtained the unique skill Avarice, which allows her to influence people's desires. And with this in her arsenal, the world is nothing more than her personal sandbox. And at the age of three, she was introduced to her grandfather, Granville Rozo, the most powerful person in the West. Gran bluntly asks why she didn't immediately try to control his mind, so she reveals his ambitions were too big for her to influence. He wants to know who this little girl truly is, so she announces herself to be Maribel the Greedy. Luckily, Gran takes a liking to her, even naming her to be his successor, as the Rosa family seeks to acquire world peace. Then for the following seven years, Granville teaches Maribel everything there is to know about this world, and now she's using all that knowledge against Demon Lord Rimuru. Allow me to give a big shout out to my newest patron, Ricardo Safe. 